have to admit, I'm really nervous. I've done this only a few, couple times now, and I, I still get nervous every time. Um, I spent the last three years pretty much locked in a library, um, you know, wearing ratty jeans and a baseball hat and sifting through musty old archives. And I don't even break for lunch. I just sort of run to the bathroom and gnaw thoroughly on a cereal bar and rush back to my seat and get right back into what I was doing. Um, so I've become a bit of a recluse uh, the last three years, and most of the people I've talked to have been dead. Um, but, you know, luckily you don't have to be alive to be interesting, um, so that was good. So before I came, actually before I started this whole, before the book came out, I, I called up my agent um, to ask him if he had any public speaking tips. And he's this inveterate New Yorker. He's this suave, charismatic guy who always knows the right thing to say. And, you know, I said, you know, give me some help here. And, and the only advice he could give me was, well, you're a Philly girl. Just don't try to be charming. <laughs> so, you know, you think living in the South would have helped me with charm, like, for five years? But no, apparently not. Um, so, so what does that leave me with? You know, I can hail a cab. I can um, recite all the presidents. But apparently I can't be charming, which is going to make the next few minutes we spend here together very awkward for all of us. Um, but I'm going to try my best. And uh, luckily, I'm here to talk about Minna and Ada Everly, who were probably the two most charming women, um, except for the big city burlesque who ever lived. Um, Minna and Ada Everly were charming for a living. Um, and I came about the Everly sister story in a, in a very personal way. My great-grandmother and her sister immigrated to the United States from Slovenia in 1905. And they settled in Pittsburgh, but one weekend the sister took a trip to Chicago and was never heard from again. Um, so I was always intrigued and haunted by this bit of family lore. And when I began in investigating Chicago around the turn of the century, and I came upon all these stories of these girls disappearing, um, they really captured my imagination. Chicago was this, you know, fantastic, bustling, important city at the time, but it was also very dangerous. And they had these entire guidebooks about which streets to avoid, when establishments to stay away from, and they had these, like, crazy, lurid titles like Chicago and its cesspools of infamy. Um, so it was really easy for me, especially on these research trips to Chicago, to imagine my relative falling victim of some nefarious force. Um, of course, I also imagined she became a sporting girl, um, as they called her hookers back in the day. Uh, uh, but in which case, I certainly hope she was Everly Club material, but who knows. Um, so once I, once I happened upon the Everly sisters, I became enthralled, and not only with the, these cunning, fascinating, ingenious businesswomen, but with the time period in which they operated. Um, oops, and I think I... Oh, no, I'm good. Uh, you know, America was experiencing this major identity crisis at the time. Um, you know, a lot of that had to do with immigration. People were coming in droves from Eastern and Southern Europe. A lot of it had to do with urbanization and people moving from their rural hometowns to the big bad cities for the first time. A lot of it had to do with the changing worlds of women, and most of it had to do with sex. Um, you know, and I was really struck the more I got into my research, the more I, I saw that there were parallels between the culture war that was waged against the Everly sisters and their brothel in Chicago's red light district and what's going on today. You know, we're still debating issues like immigration. We're still debating the role of uh, religion uh, in government and the idea of legislating morality. On a very personal note, <laughs> I happen to live in Midtown on Piedmont, and we're debating the issue of hookers on my corner. Um, <laughs> there was something posted on YouTube just a couple weeks ago where, where we have these, you know, crazy vigilante um, midtown security people who will ride around in vans and like do stakeouts at 4 a.m. and catch people uh, soliciting hookers, you know, these, um, and, and especially if they're driving in their company van. So, <laughs> so they'll stand outside with a megaphone and their their camera rolling and say, "I'm sending this to your boss. I'm sending this to your boss." And the guy like sort of tries to slink away and say, "I'm just getting coffee. I'm just getting coffee. I don't know what you're talking about." And the, and the hooker comes down. She has like 10 feet nails and she's rapping on the camera. And um, Anyway, this is posted on YouTube and there's a, there's a war in my own you know, complex about whether or not we should provide social services for these women, women, some of them, um, <laughs> or whether or not we should you know, lock them all up and throw away the key. So, you know, the, the, the ongoing debate about prostitution was something that fascinated me and, and I wanted to see how it was playing out at the turn of the century. Um, and, and like America, the Everly sisters were experiencing a sort of identity crisis before they became the world's most famous madams. Um, I spent about three years in the, in the book researching them, and I still don't know if I know the exact truth. Uh, in the book, I call them the 19th century amalgamation of Martha Stewart and Madonna. Um, 
because they were very, they were perfectionists. They, they knew exactly what they wanted their house to look like. They knew they had to get rid of the girls that they first met, you know. Um, they knew exactly how many years to shave off their ages and get away with it. Uh, they were very savvy. And they also reinvented their histories um, and, and sort of de deleted all of the bad things that happened in their past and, and presented themselves as these upstanding aristocratic women. Uh, anybody who writes nonfiction, I'm guessing there are some writers here, uh, knows that the best thing that can happen is when you're plugging away for months at a time and then you suddenly happen upon a break that you've been waiting for. Uh, and this happened to me one day when I was, um, I had been looking for the Everly sisters' great niece. I knew she was out there. I knew she existed. And one day, you know, I'd been sending letters and letters. They kept coming back. No address, no, no such name. One day I finally get a phone call. And he says, you know, my name is William DeMent. Are you Karen Abbott? I said, yes. He says, I understand you've been looking for Evelyn DeMent. I said, yes. He said, well, she's 80 years old. She's my mother. She's sitting next to me. Do you want to talk to her? And I was like, well, yes. And she's 80, so hurry. You know, put her on the phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she gets on the phone. And the first thing, I'll never forget, it was about, I was in Atlanta, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning, our time, and so she's in Colorado, it's a little bit earlier there, and the first thing she says to me is, you know, in these clip the rest, the cratic tones that I cannot properly emulate, um, she says, you have to excuse me if you hear me chewing, I'm noshing on the most delicious bit of caviar, and I was just like, lady, it's like 10, you know, and, but it was, it, I love that because it struck me as this very Everly-like thing, it was, you know, not only was she eating the caviar at 10 in the morning, she had to make a point of telling me about it. You know, and I, I put down my lucky charms and um, just sort of said, okay, well, you know, talk to me. So she started talking to me, and, you know, she what she did was a huge favor. She um, started dispelling all of the myths about the Everly sisters' lives. Uh, they had presented themselves as these these women of a very important Southern family, which was true. They, they initially came from a family in Virginia. One of the, their ancestors was a first First settler of Fredericksburg. Um, they came. There were doctors, surgeons, lawyers, uh, senators, congressmen, even a descendant of Andrew Jackson in their family. You know, and they, they said that they had this very privileged upbringing where they had this doting homemaker mother and this wealthy lawyer father who paid for elocution lessons and theatrical lessons, and they had private tutoring and they read these books, and it was life was you know this this big dream. Um, but she just thought all these myths. You know, their mother actually died when they were eight and ten years old. They didn't have a mother doting on them. They lost several siblings um, to death. They lost a sibling because the family was poor after the Civil War decimated um, the family. Uh, they lost their farm because they couldn't pay the taxes anymore, and so the family had to give up a brother because they couldn't afford him anymore. Um, and she also suggested that their father had forced them into prostitution. Um, and their whole line about that was that they just happened to, on a whim, become madams, um, which, you know, struck me as suspect in the beginning, but it was the first time I ever heard a theory behind how they might have gotten into the business. Um, but she ended our conversation by stressing that she thought these women were ladies. I should write about them as if they were ladies. I should consider them ladies and, and make sure everybody else who would read the book would get come away with the impression that they were ladies. Um, and, and the more I learned about the Levy District, which was Chicago's red light district at the turn of the century, you know, the more I I came to agree with her. Uh, the Levy District was this sort of cesspool of block after block of five-cent brothels um, where madams treated their girls as disposable commodities. You know, they kept a whipper on staff. Um, they didn't care if the girl had, was infected with syphilis. She went to work anyway. Um, they kept a doctor on staff to, a charlatan doctor who would sort of forge the reports. Um, and they really just sort of um, had no, you know, they, they kept in mind that these girls would probably be very short, you know, quick turnover. These girls would be dead within five years, and that's how they treated them. Um, and the early sisters sort of took the exact opposite approach, and they wanted to elevate the industry. Their whole argument was that if we elevate the industry and, and remove the stain from a stigmatized profession, nobody's going to have a problem with it. Um, so, you know, consequently, the Everly sisters gave their girls couture gowns, they fed them gourmet food, uh, they tutored them in the poetry of Longfellow, um, you know, and, and one of the Everly Club's favorite clients said, you know, Minna, Madam Minna, that's educating the wrong, the wrong end of a whore, <laughs> but, um, but they important for these girls to, to actually be treated as valuable investments and to, and to elevate themselves and, and to become valued, respected members of society who were making $100 a week when the shop girl was making six. 
Um, and the Everly sisters were so immersed in the idea of, of elevating this industry that they didn't even, you know, they weren't concerned with, you know, rivals and, and the sort of culture war that was flaring up about them. They were concerned with uh, propriety and decorum and with doing what they did better than anyone else in the world. Um, and they did, they did accomplish that. They were the best madams in the world by far. Um, Sorry. They, um, anybody who was anyone in Chicago or who passed through Chicago came to the Everly Club. Um, there was Theodore Dreiser. There was the poet Edgar Lee Masters. There was the famous um, black boxing champion Jack Johnson. There was uh, John Barrymore. Um, and there were some clients who, who aren't famous but who had some pretty spectacular stories. Uh, one by the name of Uncle Ned who, you know, once a year... He, would, he had enough money. This is why the Everly sisters tolerated him. He had one, enough money that once a year around the holidays, he would come to the Everly Club, pay enough to shut the whole place down. And he didn't want to go upstairs. He didn't want any favors. He didn't want tricks. He didn't want to look at naked women. He just wanted two buckets of ice. And he stuck his bare feet in these buckets of ice, drank a tall glass of sarsaparilla, while the girls sang jingle bells around him. Um, so that was that was his, guy, you know. And, and after every every time he visited, Minna would say, you know, entertaining most men in the parlors is more tiresome than what the girls lose their social standing over. So I think she was probably thinking of Uncle Ned uh, in that case. Um, they also entertained one of the most famous clients they ever had was a guy by the name of Prince Henry, who. Came came from Prussia, um, he was there to accept a gift on behalf of his brother, the Kaiser, who was Kaiser at the time. And, you know, this sort of bored press corps in New York greeted him and, and said, oh, Prince, you know, welcome to America. Would you like, are you going to see the Grand Canyon? Or are you going to see the Statue of Liberty? What do you most desire to see during your time in America? And he was like, you know, who are you kidding? The Everly Club in Chicago. Um, so the Prince made his way to the Everly Club, and, and Minna and Ada were very excited about this, and they very discreetly, as was their way, began planning for this celebration. And Minna would consider herself a born actress in which she was. Everything she did was an act. She, she was never not on. And she had this big elaborate plan to reenact the killing of Dionysus' son, um, which involved a cloth bowl that was rolled into the room and piles of uncooked sirloin. Um, so the harlots were to circle around the cloth bowl and just sort of bite at it. And every time they bit down on the cloth bowl and spat some cotton out, a, a male servant would bellow in the corner and, and sort of mimic the, the, the cloth bowl getting killed. It was, um, the, you know, but the Germans love this. It was great. Um, so this evening culminated when Prince Henry, um, when a girl got up to dance for Prince Henry. She began dancing on the table and kicking her feet in a spirited can-can, and her shoe flew off across the room, collided with a glass of champagne, and one of the prince's entourage said, oh, the darling must not get her feet wet, and just proceeded to drink champagne from the slipper. Um, so that sort of started a trend that was launched across the country. Uh, you know, but not everybody appreciated the Everly Sisters' attempts to elevate the industry. Um, there were about five sides, you know, and I'll give them very briefly, except for one because she's my favorite. Um, there was a minister by the name of Ernest Bell who who started a thing called the Midnight Mission, and we preach outside the Everly Club every night and hand out pamphlets where men's heads were rotting from syphilis, and thinking this would dissuade them from going to the brothel didn't work. Um, but he he stood outside every night, and just prayed for these fallen girl souls, and and you know, wrote these really weepy poems about how he's seen enough there to make the stones vomit. Um, there was a lawyer by the name of Clifford Rowe who was the exact opposite of Ernest Bell. He was a manipulative, cunning um, man who was only in this to sort of advance his own political agenda. Um, he's the one who was really responsible for the white slavery scare. He sort of facilitated um, thousands of stories and books and magazines and articles about these girls who were being abducted off the street and drugged and raped and sold into brothels never to be heard from again. It was sort of like 19th century terror alerts. Um, and people were just terrified about this. And he was a bigger whore than anybody in the Everly Club. He was a complete, completely out for himself. Um, there were two politicians by the name of Bathhouse John and Hanky Dink who were aldermen, and they threw this really fabulous, opulent ball. You know, not a little, a little rowdier than we have here tonight, but um, it was sort of like the, the uh, Victorian era pimp and hose ball. And 
the, the Levy District people would just come to this thing every year and celebrate their debauchery with impunity, and they would, you know, harlots dressed up like nuns, uh, harlots dressed up like five-year-old boys, guzzling champagne from pails, you know, wading knee-deep in beer, stabbing each other with hat pins, which was like, it was a fabulous time. And this all netted $30,000 for Bathhouse John and Hanky Dink. It was a very uh, intricate quid pro quo graph system going on. Um, and the, their most formidable foes, though, uh, were the rival madams. Um, and there were several rival madams in the Levy District who did not at all appreciate the Everly sisters sort of sauntering in with their high manners and these, these tales of aristocracy down in the South. And um, they actually had a, a, a group called the Friendly Friends, these madams. And it was a sort of labor union for madams in which they gathered once a week and, and drank tea and knitted and discussed madaming and whipping and all the various things associated with it. Um, and they did not invite the Everly sisters to join the Friendly Friends, uh, which was considered a huge snub, but the Everly sisters did not care. In fact, they were like, you take your friendly friends, we don't, we don't want to be involved. So they didn't, it was, the fact that they didn't care was even a bigger snub. Um, and there was a madam by the name of Vic Shaw, who is the Everly sisters' biggest foe. And she was this sort of, um, the queen of the levy district before the Everly sisters came to town. And she, you know, was not an uptown girl, and she did not appreciate being showed what uptown was. She hated the Everly sisters, in fact, so much that she tried to frame them twice for murder. Um, one of the, uh, you know, I still like her anyway. One of the, um, one of the times had to do with Marshall Field Jr., who was, you know, obviously a huge name in Chicago. But he was shot in 1905, and there were all kinds of rumors flying about about what happened to the air and what, what happened, and uh, this spread all across the country. But the most persistent and juiciest piece of gossip held that he was shot at the Everly Club while cavorting with a harlot. Um, so and that the Everly sisters sort of whisked his body out in the middle of the night and were able to have the whole thing quashed because they had that sort of power in Chicago. Uh, the second time happened when, a few years later, um, when a courtesan named Katie was uh, suspected of having a, dealings with a morphine trader at the Everly Club's door. And this is the other thing about the Everly sisters. They had very high standards for their girls as much as for their clients. Uh, girls were not allowed to drink, do drugs, uh, could work with white slavers or pimps. They had these very high standards. Vic Shaw did not have these standards. In fact, if an Everly Club girl got dismissed for committing any one of those sins, she went up the street to Vic Shaw's house and Vic Shaw welcomed her with open arms and let her in. So on this particular night, a uh, millionaire by the name of Nat Moore uh, was drunk inside the Everly Club and he was being hit on, being worked over by a girl named Katie. Katie was suspected of having dealings with a morphine guy earlier and Minnett approached her and confronted her about this. And Katie gave her lip and Minnett immediately dismissed her and said, I've had enough of you, get out of here. And where does she go but up the street to Vic Shaw's house? So a few hours later, this Nat Moore's millionaire playboy's body is found dead in one of Vic Shaw's bedrooms. And Katie is struck in with a bit of conscience and decides she can't let Minna, she can't let Minna and Ada take the rap for this because Vic Shaw wants to plant his body in the Everly Club furnace. Um, so I'm just going to read a very brief section from that. Um, the phone rang inside the Everly Club. It took a minute and a moment to distinguish the voice on the other end. Words choppy with rage, each syllable an exclamation. Katie. They're framing you, the harlot whisper screamed. They've got a dead body at Shawl's, and they're going to plant it in your furnace. It's Nat Moore. It's a dirty trick, and I won't let him do that to you. The line went dead. Minna accessed that pocket of her brain where her thoughts were calculated and stripped of impulse, where she was most like Ada. This was Vic Shaw, she reminded herself. Jealous, inept Vic Shaw, who had already tried to frame her for murder and failed. A pathetic, mediocre madam who couldn't influence the mayor, or turn bathhouse John and Hinky Dink against her and Ada, or whip the entire country into such a religious frenzy that it lost all ability to reason. A madam doomed to remain relevant only to herself. Minna would call a trusted lieutenant, walk down the street, and make sure Vic Shaw understood that this battle had been decided long ago, and it was the Everleys who had won. Shea Shaw was half the size of the Everly Club. A double-decker bay window dominated its left side. One plane of glass on the bottom was broken out. An ornate basket weave molding curved over the front entrance, dropping down into two Corinthian-style columns that flanked the mahogany door. A rectangular window on the second floor was topped by a long, arched one on the third that curved like a fingertip. At a distance, it appeared Vic Shaw's brothel was flipping off Dearborn Street. Min and her friend climbed the seven steps to the front door and barreled in. Shards of glass glittered across the wood floor. The window had just been broken. 
The front parlor was a vortex of waving arms and screeching voices, a big shawl positioned at its eye. What's going on here? The elderly lieutenant called. Bodies unlocked, fists unclenched. A harlot released her grip on another's hair. Two plump arms, sheathed in black silk, pushed forward through the mob, separating it, and the madam of the house emerged. A black feathered hat sat cockeyed atop dark hair. Bald fists disappeared into the folds of her waist. None of your goddamn business, Fickshaw said, taking her time with each word. It had been a while since Minna had seen her rival up close. Fickshaw had gained at least 70 pounds since the sisters came to town, the weight distributing itself coolly around her midsection, its circumference now equaling that of her breasts. Three chins drooped over a neck as thick as a bear's. Heavy powder settled into the deep lines around her mouth, and her eyes were two dead things lost amid streaks of paint. She lied about her age, too, in a new, shaving off at least a decade, turning middle age into relative youth. But Shaw's body, having earned her a living for most of her life, had tired of the ruse. It was claiming its due now with interest. Nix on that, Minna's friend said. What's up? Who's the victim? Murder, huh? I could see it written all over you. The harlots, nervous and weeping, let the story come tumbling out. Vickshaw announced that her place was closed for now. All the inmates should scram. To China, she suggested. There was nothing left for the madam to do but call the police, and so she did, glaring at Minna while she dialed. I like her. <laughs> um, anyway, thanks. So, if you guys have any questions, I'd like to turn it over to you. So... Especially if you've been drinking, because then they'll be very interesting. <laughs> Anyone? Okay. Hi. Hi. What type of archives were there that let you create this story? Um, there were a couple really great things. One of my favorite things was um, the Vic Shaw family album. Um, and none of you want your family album to look like the Vic Shaw family album, I, I tell you. Uh, it's at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and um, there were two things in there that really um, that really made me pleased to find. One was a coupon that shows you sort of the, the mingling of politics in Chicago, politics and sex in Chicago, and obviously it's still mixed today, but there was... Um, a little coupon. There was a mayor election in 1907, and the guy was a Republican. He needed all the help he could get um, to, to win this election. So in 1907, he strikes a deal with Vic Shaw, who at least you know did this right, uh, and she printed these coupons with his his picture on the front and the word stenciled beneath. Our pal. If he wins and you find this card in the parlor, bring it to Madam. You get five dollars in trade free election night only. <laughs> so that was a, it was an interesting tidbit to find. And, and the other thing in Vic Shaw's family album was, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned they all keep a whipper on staff. Um, Vic Shaw's whipper was named Lil Kowalski, and Lil Kowalski posed for a photograph. It was like an Olin Mills photograph, you know, with like a misty background, and she had this sort of flowery collar on and these horn room glasses and this prim, tidy little bun, and she looked like a school marm. I don't know, she scared the crap out of me because I went to Catholic school and she looked like everybody who beat me up. Um, but there was, you know, her, her caption underneath, it said, Lil Kowalski, Lil the Whipper, beat up over 1,000 harlots. <laughs> it was kind of an odd thing to have your captured. I mean, she did not look like she could beat anyone up, but, I, I, you know, and if you couldn't take Lil, you probably deserved to get beat up. But um, So th that was my favorite collection. But there was a lot of really good information out there, luckily. So, hi. Hi. Um, Oh, if, if nobody can hear the question, she asked me for my research, um, did I think that prostitution is moral, should it be legalized? Um, you know, that's a tough question. I, I think lots of things should be legalized. Uh, you know, it, it, and I tell all these sort of fun stories in the book, um, you know, about Prince Henry and, and Uncle Ned and this guy named the Gold Coin Kid who I didn't really go into, but who used to throw coins at um, one of the harlots' privates and was very bizarre. Um, but, you know, I tell these fun stories in the book, but there was an undercurrent of tragedy there, too. You know, a lot of these girls entered prostitution because uh, there was nothing else for them to do. Their husbands deserted them. They had young children to take care of. Or maybe their parents died and they had younger siblings to take care of. Um, a lot of them were considered promiscuous and and decided, well, I might as well make some money doing this. Um, so and the early club even had some, some tragedies. Uh, one of the girls committed suicide. Um, and another girl, you know, they, they put all this emphasis on appearance and, and wearing.
wearing uh, designer gowns and fabulous jewelry and whatnot. Um, but one of their girls, you know, was victimized by that. She was found in an alley with her hands cut off and all of her jewels um, stolen, you know, with her hands, obviously. Um, so it was sort of, you know, it wasn't all, you know, there was definitely some, some tragic circumstances that led to this. And I, and I think that's obviously true today. I mean... You know, it's, it's not always a choice that... If it's the only choice you have, is it really a choice? Um, so, anyone else? Hi. Hey, we're in Chicago as the levy district, and where do you do your research? Uh, it's on the near south side. It's uh, The parameters at the time were 18th to 22nd, Wabash to Clark. So, which it's now the site. There's nothing left of the levy district, unfortunately. I, w I went down there just to scout around, just to, you know, and you can um, sort of feel the spirits of people there to be a little weary and metaphysical about it. But, um, but there's nothing there, and the site of the Everly Club is actually a public housing project now called uh, Raymond Hilliard Homes. But it's on the National Register of Historic Places because it was um, designed by a renowned Chicago architect, so that's kind of cool. But unfortunately, um, Nothing, nothing left of the old horror house or horror house era exists there. So, except for horrors that might be roaming around today. But <laughs> anyone else? Hi. Hi. Um, when you were doing your research, did you find any roadblocks? Um, roadblocks. She asked if I ran into any difficulties along the way. Uh, you know, I think the biggest difficulty was trying to unravel who these women were. Um, I, one of the biggest helps I had, like anybody who I told the story about, anybody who learned about the Everly Sisters as I was going through it became immediately as fascinated by them as I was. Um, I actually made uh, a friend with a guy who runs the cemetery where they're buried. Um, and he was really, he was sort of a genealogy buff, and he was really helpful in helping me piece together their, their lineage. And he became so involved with the Everly Sisters that he actually bought, bought the plot of land next to their graves, oh. which is either really creepy or charming. I, and, and I'm choosing to think it's charming because I'm having dinner with him next month, and I don't want to think he's creepy. So, but but it, it was sort of like the more people learned about them, the more they were eager to help. So that was good. But, Anyone else? Hi, again. Um, I was reading today about Jack. I think his last name is uh, the Louisiana Senator guy. Oh, Vitter? David? Vitter. Is it David? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of that these days where uh, uh, politicians um, get kind of exposed, uh, get, you know, their call records, call records, get requisitions, stuff like that. So I was wondering if uh, back in the time period you were looking at, if um, the madams or the car girls ever um, uh, exposed their, their clients um, well, the Everly sisters were really discreet about it. I think there was a level of discretion there that's probably not, you know. And, the, of course, information wasn't disseminated as easily as, as it is today. There was no, you know, levy internet. Like, where, you know, there was nobody knocking on the, the car doors with cameras and sending them to YouTube. Um, so I think they, you know, there was a level of discretion. The other thing was it was more accepted. It was sort of, um, this was, and it was also a gentleman's club. It was um, a place of privilege to go to, not a place of shame. Um, and if you could get in, you were lucky. You know, you paid fifty dollars to get in in an hour when a free course meal was fifty cents. Um, so, it was sort of, if you could get in there, you wanted to be there, and you know, you probably wanted people to know about it too. In fact, one of the things in the book was, you know, the, the mythology of the term "get laid" came from the Everlades name. Um, you know, men would say, "I'm going to get Everlade tonight," which was eventually shortened. So, so it was sort of a boast. But, hi. Uh, they're great niece. I got in touch with um, Irving Wallace's two children, who, whose father knew them very well, the sisters well, and um, Hillary Masters, the son of Edgar Lee Masters. I talked to him too, so I tried to track down everybody I could. Did you find things from them that you couldn't find? Yeah. Them? Yeah. What were you surprised? What really surprised you the most when you did your research? Um, what really surprised you? Probably the fact that I most identify with Vic Shaw, <laughs> which, uh, you know, 
I, I, you know, I was telling my, my friend, you know, Ada, Ada was this sort of master organizer and, and um, ingenious businesswoman who could do math, which I cannot do, and um, calculate exactly how much they, you know, she was the money person and the business savvy person. Minna was this really masterful social manipulator who could go out and control everybody in a room. And, you know, I'm lucky I can control myself when I go out. So, um, so that was probably Vickshaw, you know, just that sort of level of, of uh, affinity I had for her. So, anyone else? Or, hi. Um, he asked if either of the sisters had a positive male figure in their life. I don't think so. And their whole, their whole, um, they, they claim to hate men. They, they, they hated men, but made, you know, went out of their way to make, to pleasure men, to make men feel, you know, it was, it was the ultimate form of exploitation, and they were very masterful at it. And these were two women who were full of contradictions. Um, Minna said in interviews to Irving Wallace, you know, I love your sex, I adore it, I esteem it highly. Um, and then on the side, you know, she'd be saying, well, look at these idiots paying $50 to walk in our door. So, um, no, I think their, their whole business, part of the business was to revenge at the, the sort of humiliation they felt and the degradation they felt when they first became um, involved in the sporting life. So, hi. I'm sorry? Oh, he asked how they got to Chicago. They, they um, were in Omaha. They, this is how business savvy they were. They went to the Trans-Mississippi Exposition because they knew all these people were going to be passing through. And they set up a brothel there. They, they convinced somebody to fa uh, give them the funding and back them, set up a brothel there, doubled their money, and then realized, oh, <laughs> there's nobody rich in, in Omaha. You know, all these people who were, could afford us were passing through, and now they're all gone. There's nothing left for us here. And where do we go? And the answer was Chicago. And they wanted to go to a city where there was no high class madam and luckily the um, city's high class madam had just retired and moved to the suburbs so <laughs> the Everly sisters immediately moved in and, um, and took over so anyone else no <laughs>